maybe soon it could be morning night or noon till then we'll watch and work and pray when he comes i'll go home there to stay maybe today my lord will come for me maybe today my savior i shall see maybe today from sin i shall be free jesus will come and i will go home it may be today my lord will come i know not when but this is sure he'll come again with eager eyes i'll look for him in his presence new joy will begin maybe today my lord will come for me maybe today my savior i shall see maybe today from sin i shall be free jesus will come and i will go home it may be today we'll sing his song forevermore when we have entered heaven's door redeemed from all our sin and strife there will no perfect love endless life maybe today my lord will come for me maybe today my savior i shall see maybe today from sin i shall be free jesus will come and i will go home it may be today great song amen what a great thought maybe today open your bibles if you would to second kings again get second kings and this time let's go to chapter eight second kings in chapter eight and if we have guests today in our congregation it's a blessing to have you and we we very much appreciate you being with us today and coming and joining us as we seek to honor the word of god and honor the name of the lord jesus christ and what we've been doing here on Sunday mornings is uh, going through a period in Old Testament Jewish history that's recorded in our Bibles known as the Divided Kingdom. Now, the kingdom goes from under Solomon's reign and is divided uh, following his reign where you've got a throne in the north and you've got a throne in the south of the land of Israel. You have two thrones and two kingdoms over one people. And Jesus specifically said that a kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to desolation. And this is the truth that I've been trying to emphasize uh, these many weeks there, that nothing divided against itself will stand. And this is the history of both the kingdoms of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, uh, beginning with Solomon, who is a man who gets off track and becomes double-minded. And because he becomes double-minded, he becomes spiritually unstable, begins to stumble, and then that leads to his fall. And uh, certainly there were consequences after Solomon fell. The kingdom divided in two, and the northern kingdom, with its first king, Jeroboam, uh, gets off track. Uh, God had put him in a position of leadership give him responsibilities. This man forgot why he was in that position, why he was trusted uh, with those responsibilities. Got his eye off of the goal that God had set before him, the lost side of the objective. And as a result, he began to simply try to hang on to his position and manipulate
manipulate things so that he could keep his authority over the people. And as a result, Jeroboam gets off track. He, he of course, loses focus. And everybody that follows suit after Jeroboam, the Bible says they go after uh, the sin of Jeroboam. And the thing gets off track, and it never does get back on track there. And as a result of their apostasy, of their backsliding against the Lord, following the sins of Jeroboam, eventually their national defenses, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, their defenses are completely gone, and Assyria comes in and lays the kingdom to desolate. I mean, it's wasted. And that's their history. Roughly about a hundred years later, the kingdom of Judah, which had good kings on the throne from time to time, still yet the people would wander away from God. They would be up sometimes, down the next. And uh, anything but consistent, they present a wavering history, which eventually, of course, weakens their national defenses. And, uh, and what ends up happening is Babylon comes in eventually and destroys the land of Judah, destroys the capital city of Jerusalem, and destroys the, uh, the temple of God that was in the city of Jerusalem. And that too, that place is brought to desolation. Now the kingdom divided could not stand, just as homes that are divided cannot stand, and people that are divided against themselves cannot stand. That is the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, and there is no one in here that is an exception to that rule. The house of Israel, remember now, have a special history. They are the descendants of Jacob. Jacob is a man that God changed his name to Israel. And as a people, they have a unique history being born as a nation as they were freed from Egyptian bondage. And God uses that picture of their deliverance out from that nation and that, that place of bondage as an illustration to us of the salvation of the Lord uh, that we've experienced the moment we called upon the Lord Jesus Christ for, to be our Savior. And that's what's illustrated there. And they would go as a nation. And, and as they left Egypt, they would go into a place of the wilderness wanderings. And that wilderness period there for them was a trying time. And, and the Spirit of God uses that time and that experience to show uh, the, the effect of the carnal life. That though you may be delivered from uh, bondage, from Egypt, our, our world, amen, we're delivered through grace and God giving us new life. Yet, if we don't learn to walk with Jesus Christ and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll live a carnal life. And that's represented by that, that wilderness wanderings there that so few ever made it out of that time. As a matter of fact, there were only two. There was Joshua and Caleb. But there came a new generation there showing the new man. And they would go into that fruitful land of their promise, the fruitful land of their possession. And uh, that shows the spiritual life. Now understand this today. Every believer, once they're born again, has two natures. There's the old man and there is the new man. As the old man... That's connected to Adam. That's connected to the first birth. That's connected uh, to the flesh. Being connected to the flesh, it's connected to the world. Being connected to the world, it's connected to temptation. Being connected to temptation, it's connected to sin. Being connected to sin, it's connected to death. Then there's the new man. And the new man is the regenerated spirit that has been joined to God's Holy Spirit, which is, the Bible says, created in righteousness and true holiness. And that nature is connected to Christ and connected to heaven. And thus it's connected to life. And thus it's connected to fruit in this life. Now, one man, the old man, represents the old life. The new man represents the new life. And as believers in the New Testament, we are commonly told to put the one old man off and put on the new man so that the situation today, as we look at the nation of Israel, a divided kingdom, divided against itself, they were one people in the house of Jacob, but there were two thrones. And in our life, myself speaking, I may be one man, but I have two natures. And you as a believer in Christ, are one person, but there are two men. There's the old man and there's the new man. And thus there are two thrones, two forms of authority. One nature is connected to the dominion of sin. The other is connected to the reign of righteousness. And trying to live your life as a believer, straddling the fence between those two natures, that's an impossibility. Because we're all going to be subject to one or the other. 
keep in mind this is in the context of first and second kings as we've been looking here on sunday mornings at these books of the bible and looking at rulers and dominion and reigning and authority with all that before us, think of what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 12. He says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Listen to what he said. For sin shall not have dominion over you. He says, For you're not under the law but under grace. In other words, he's referring back to that time we were saved like Colossians chapter 1 speaks. And it speaks of the time that we were delivered from the power of darkness and we were translated into the kingdom of God and His dear Son. So now we serve King Jesus. And we will not in this life have victory over sin by the power of the flesh. We won't overcome sin by observing the law. It'll come over, it'll only come as we serve God and walk with Jesus Christ by the grace of God. So Paul says, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? He answers, God forbid. Amen. What a what a thing for a Christian to have the attitude that sin doesn't matter. Sin matters. <laughs> Folks, sin is a big deal. The fact that we all commit sin doesn't absolve us from the sin we've committed. It breaks fellowship with God. Man. We're walking in the light or we're walking in darkness. We're walking after the new man or we're walking after the old man. Remember, it was sin that took Jesus Christ to the cross. So yes, sin is a big deal. And Paul says, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? He says, God forbid. That is the proper Christian attitude. God forbid that I should just learn to live with my sin and treat it as if it's no big deal when it is a big deal to God. He goes on to say, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now again, I remind you this morning before we really get going here, we are, we are given a command in the Bible to be holy. The Lord has said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And involved in following that command, again I remind you, is the idea of being consecrated unto the Lord, of committing ourselves as Christian men and women to wholly follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There are biblical examples of this given to us in the men Joshua and Caleb who come up out of Egypt. And they enter into that land of promise. They're the only two from that generation that came out of Egypt that got to. And the Bible qualifies them as to why they were able to go into the land of promise. It says that they wholly followed the Lord in Numbers 32. Why did Joshua and Caleb, why being delivered from Egypt, were they able to get through that wilderness period of wandering and go into that land of promise? The Bible says because they wholly followed the Lord. Didn't say they didn't have weak times, they didn't have down times, didn't say that they didn't have collapses of judgment from time to time because they did. But the fact is their commitment in following the Lord throughout life got them through those rough spots. It got them through those weak times there. It got them through those times where their judgment failed them. They were able to get back up and keep following on because they were committed. That's what life was about for them. Whereas all that other old generation that did not make it into the land of promise but died in that wilderness wandering around with no direction, they didn't go into the promised land. Why? Because Numbers 32, 11 says, quote, they did not wholly follow after the Lord. So wholly following after the Lord, we're talking about a consecrated life. Just realizing who we are to the Lord, separated unto the Lord, not a Sunday morning thing, but a seven-day-a-week thing. This is what life is. This is what God expects us to, to deem this life as being. And, and those that try to make out their fellowship with the Lord to be a Sunday morning thing, listen to me, they never have true fellowship with the Lord. Man. That's not to say that, hey, on Sunday morning they may hear a message that stirs them or they may hear a song that stirs them or they may feel good in their conscience about having been to church that, that one time that week, but there's just a lot more to living for the Lord than just one service a week. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm glad you're here. Amen. 
You preach, well, if you don't want me here, I'll, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm glad you're here. I'm just saying, hey, there's more to serving the Lord than coming to church, Amen. especially once a week. Amen. He gave you a book to read. He, he's given you means by which you can approach the throne of grace to find help in time of need and to pray and to walk with Him and talk with Him and have fellowship with Him. It's not a, just a Sunday morning thing, you understand. And those that just treat it as it's a Sunday morning thing never get planted. They never get rooted. Therefore, they never bear fruit in their life as far as the new man because they're not planted. You can, nothing, that's, nothing that's not planted or, 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 or steadfast is going to bear fruit. And a Christian's no exception. You have to be rooted before you can bear fruit in your season, the Bible says. And we're talking about this fruit. Think about what we're talking about. We're not just talking about love, joy, and peace as people would define it. We're talking about the, the attributes of Christ in our life. Divine fruit from the Spirit of God. We're not just talking about joy as in going to a theme park. We're talking about the joy of the Lord. The love of Christ. Amen. The faith of Christ. The peace of God that passes all understanding. We're talking about His gentleness and His goodness. Amen. And, and, and His temperance. We can have those things in our life. As a result of yielding and following after Jesus Christ, anything divided against itself will fall. Therefore, as Christians, we need to be completely devoted to Christ. Not just Sunday morning. Throughout life. Throughout the week. Throughout the month. Throughout the year. Amen. Throughout life. A believer becomes divided as they become content to live with a double-minded approach to life. In other words, they're seeking to appease the new man by doing a religious thing or two, while at the same time trying to satisfy the old man in the direction and the things of their life, the ambitions of their life. All those things connected to the old man. Listen, that person that is entering life like that, that's his approach. He's headed for a fall. That person who's trying to live with a double heart that God condemns in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 33. And, and having a double mind, James chapter 1. Not having that, that single eye that Jesus talked about. They lose their vision, therefore. They forget what true goals are. What true objectives are in life. They're in losing direction. They lose their balance. Losing their balance. They begin to stumble. Stumbling, they begin to fall. Till there's a complete collapse. Last Sunday morning, we began to look at a man that often gets overlooked because he is in the shadow of the great prophet Elijah, named very similar to his, and that, of course, is Elisha. And we focused upon the trials of Elisha last week there when he was pressed, pressed as a servant of the Lord, strengthened in order that he might press on. That is the design of these trials in our life. We enter into these proving times where there's pressure and the pressure, the pressing we're facing is to develop the ability to press on, to get us stronger, to make us more committed in following after Christ. Amen. And then, uh, of course, uh, we looked at how the Lord tried him. He was tried on his affections. He was tried on his sincerity. He was tried on his resolve, on his faith, in his patience, in his character. At last, and this is where we left off, where we'll pick up this morning, he was tried on his received power. There, and he's manifesting that steadfast resolve and following after the Master. He doesn't turn back, not even when confronted with opposition, not when confronted with obstacles, not even when he's confronted with opportunities to go and do something else. He keeps pressing on because he has a spiritual request that he desires to be granted him, and it's that he might serve the Lord with a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And he was rewarded with such because he kept his eyes on his Master. Obviously, there's a lot we can learn from that. Again, that was a message on the trials of Elisha. This morning, the message is on the triumphs of Elisha. And for a text today, we'll just take this one verse here in chapter 8, verse 4. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 4 says, And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. Notice those words. Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And again, the message this morning is on the triumphs of Elisha. Father, I pray you'll bless this message. Help me to preach it. God, please give me utterance today. Help me to preach with the right spirit. Help us all, Lord God, to take heed to the direction of your word. 
Lord, improve our lives. Strengthen us, Lord, in our faith and in our commitment to following after Jesus Christ and serving Him. Lord, if there's someone here that's never been saved, once again, our heart is that they would be saved today. They would understand the simplicity of the gospel. They would know the invitation to come to Christ. They would come, Lord God. We pray for them. We pray the blindness be removed. And Lord, they would have understanding about their state before you. Convict them, Lord God, and show them their need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My mind, I, I think about the day that Elijah would go on to be with the Lord go up in that whirlwind and Elisha's following him around there uh, from place to place. It wasn't an easy journey and I'm sure along the way they're having fellowship. I'm sure they're talking and, and of course uh, I can't be sure what they were talking about but I just imagine Elijah is telling Elisha some things he needs to know. He is training him. He is preparing him for what's going to happen when he's gone. Elisha is Elijah's replacement. He is his ambassador. He is going to carry on the work that Elijah has begun. And, and I imagine he's telling him some things about the lessons of faith that he has learned there concerning the drying book and, and how that the, uh, uh, the ravens fed him there at that drying brook. And, and then, of course, uh, there's the matter of him going off into the land of the Zidonians while they were looking for him. He was in enemy territory. God was providing for him there just by a poor widow woman and how that widow woman's child one day had to be revived. I'm sure Elisha's learning these things. He's listening. He's listening about the showdown at Mount Carmel there and how the fire of the Lord fell. And then the rain came and just walking along there, he's all ears learning everything that he can until uh, they come to the point of their journey when right in front of them are those fiery horses and chariots. Staring right at them, the journey's over. They don't take another step. Those fiery horses and chariots charge them. And they move at them at such a speed that they part them asunder. And the, the speed is so fast that the chariots and the fiery horses there from heaven go up back to heaven. And the whirlwind uh, from the pull of the speed is so strong it's grabbed Elijah up. And he's going up to be with the Lord. And that's the way he leaves this world. And whereas I can't speak intelligently this morning on what direction Elijah was facing there. Was he looking back at the man he had trained to replace him on his way out of this world? Or, or was he looking towards the heavens as he went to be with the Lord? I don't know what Elijah was looking at. But I know for an absolute fact what Elisha was looking at. Amen. Elisha was looking at Elijah. He was keeping his eyes on the master because that was the agreement if he would keep his eyes on him when he made his ascent out of this world, then he would receive that double portion of Elijah's spirit. And there, imagine the noise that that event involved. I mean, I mean, here's these, this roaring divine fi fire from these fiery horses and chariots and this rushing mighty wind, this great whirlwind. And I mean, just uh, the tumultuous situation of Elijah going up and being raptured out of this world. And all of a sudden, it's all over with. The wind is gone. The fire is gone. The chariots are gone. The loud noise is gone. And Elijah's gone. Everything's quiet. And there in the stillness of that situation, of that moment, Elisha looks around and there's only one thing left behind. And it's the prophet's mantle. It's the same mantle that he was, he was caught with when Elijah passed by his way one day and, and, and gave it to him or, or touched him with it. And it got his attention. And he began to follow after Elijah there in 1 Kings chapter 19. That same mantle that Elijah had with him as they made their journey. Same mantle Elijah used to part the waters of Jordan as they went over on dry land. That same mantle has now been left behind. And it's there. It's the symbol there of being God's prophet, of being God's man. And now it's fallen on him. And in an immediate symbol of self-denial and consecration unto the Lord, Elisha takes up that mantle and he comes to that same river of Jordan. And there's the river that... Under Joshua's leadership, Israel had crossed, going into the land of promise. Same Jordan that he and Elijah had just crossed. Now it has to be crossed again. Only this time it has to be crossed alone. Know this, folks, that that river of Jordan, a lot of times in our songs that we sing, we speak of it almost as if it represents physical death. And that may work for Christian hymns and what have you. But as far as biblical doctrine... Crossing Jordan is not, a, is not a scene of someone going to heaven. 
Crossing Jordan is a commitment of a Christian that has said, I am leaving that old life. I'm putting off that old man and I'm putting on that new man. Amen. And it does represent death, but it's not physical death. It represents death to self. Amen. And so that as he comes to the river of Jordan, the very first work signifying his ministry as a servant of the Lord is crossing the river of Jordan once again. Folks, all of us have a river of Jordan to cross. As a matter of fact, we need to learn how to cross the river of Jordan daily. <laughs> to put off that old man and put on that new man, amen. If you want to be used of God, and I hope you do, I mean, that's what being part of a church is all about. Amen. We're not just here to gather and see each other, amen. We're here to unite and assemble together so that we together by the power of God can do the work of God. Amen. Because we are the body of Christ. He's given us His Holy Spirit and enabled us so that we can do the work so that the gospel can be furthered there. And it's not going to happen unless as individual members we each one learn how to deny ourselves and die to self because we all have our own Jordans to cross. At some point in every Christian's life, there's no avoiding it. We're going to be faced with that temptation to look back. That look back that we were committed, we're following, but then after a while there's that temptation to look back. Are we going to cross once again that barrier that prevents us from be, being used in a greater way of the Lord? And those that are young, it might even be mother or father. For those that are older, it may be son or daughter, but there's no looking back once we've entered into the service of the Lord, once we're consecrated and committed to following after Christ, not for family, not for anyone, not for anything. We're talking about holy following the Lord. We're going to be tried in that regard. Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. We hear a lot of talk about balance. And you've heard me make this point before, but I'll make it again. People speak of Christian balance. As if we're trying to balance out what is sacred unto the Lord with what is secular for the world. And the fact is that as Christian people, as born again believers in Jesus Christ, there is no part of our life that is secular. Everything is sacred. Our marriages are to be sacred. Raising our children is a sacred duty entrusted to us by God. Having a job, being an employer, being an employee, regardless of what the situation might be, whatever relationship we have, we are Christian men and women in those relationships. And we are Christian men and women with those responsibilities. And at all moments, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And the world is watching us. And we have a testimony to uphold. And the Bible says, He that nameth the name of Christ is to depart from iniquity. We're, we are to live our lives as they were sacred. Amen. In spite of the weakness, in spite of the presence of sin at work in our fleshly members, we're still to consecrate ourselves unto the Lord Amen. and to follow hard and holy after the Lord our God and be a blessing to others in the name of Jesus Christ. And we need to realize that we talk about proper balance. We're not talking about balancing that which is spiritual with that which is, is, is secular because there is no secular. Well, then what is Christian balance? Because there is a proper balance. Well, what we're talking about, we talk about balance. We're talking about balancing our walk with Jesus Christ with our work for Jesus Christ. And we can't be so far one way that we're living in isolation, always studying our Bible, but never witnessing anybody. And we can't be so far the other way where we're witnessing everybody, but we never draw away from everything and find time alone with God and get refilled. <laughs> Amen. We need to have proper balance. Amen. Where we're walking with Jesus Christ and we're working for Jesus Christ. Amen. And as Jesus is speaking to us, listen this morning, listen to me, as He's speaking about those who are worthy of Him, He's not talking about salvation. He's not talking about going to heaven. And thank God He's not. Because if He was talking about that, no one in here would get to go to heaven. Amen. Count this preacher. Because none of us are worthy. Amen. None of us. He's not talking about who's going to heaven there. He's talking about serving Him. He's talking about the honor and the privilege of working for Him. Folks, you've got to understand, uh, people got the wrong idea about work. First of all, work is a blessing. Amen. It's not, it's not a hardship. It's not a judgment. It's good. If you've got the physical health to work, that's a good thing. Amen. But then to work for Him. 
What an honor. What a privilege that the Lord would entrust you with the gospel message and say, listen, you are, you are the one I'm counting on to cast that net. I want you to witness to your relatives. I want you to witness to your friends. I want you to reach those people that live in your area. I want to use you to work for me. What an honor. What a privilege to work for him. Amen. To realize also as I was preaching here a couple of weeks ago on the Song of Solomon on Wednesday night, when we work for him, we also get to work with him. Amen. Because to enter into the yoke of Christ, the Lord says, I'll get in there with you. That's that's. Two people serving a man, and I can't carry my weight. So you know what he does? He carries my weight. And I'm, I'm privileged to be able to have those times where I'm yoked up with him. Then to understand not only my working with Christ, working for Christ, but as we work for him, he works for us. And that's out there. I can't understand all that, you know, as far as being able to adjust myself to it. But it is the truth. Amen. A man joins the military. He doesn't go into warfare at his own charges. They give him what to wear. They take care of him. They feed him. They give him the ammunition. He works for them. When we work for Jesus Christ, you know what he, just to illustrate this point, what he did, he said, you're working for me. Those feet you have are beautiful. You're carrying the gospel. Your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So you know what he does to show us a visible illustration of how he'll work for us? John chapter 13, he tied on the towel and he got down there for those disciples who were working for him and he washed their feet. The Lord will work for us when we work for him. And it's good, brother, amen, we come to this river of Jordan. It's a matter of being fit, being a proper servant for him. If we're not fit for his service, amen, it's because we don't have him elevated to the place he ought to be in our life there. And we need to be so committed to following him, we're willing to even take up a cross and follow him. Knowing where we're going with a cross on our back, following him, realizing that in his timing, this may very well change everything else about my life. Amen. That's what it means. So those that find their life, lose it. Oh, it's money. Oh, it's fun. Oh, it's this. It's that. It's position. It's popularity. What are, those that find what it is they think they're looking for end up looking back on the results of what they found and they think, well, I've wasted my life. Amen. But those that lose their life caught up in walking with Jesus Christ and working for Jesus Christ, folks, fact with my hand up today, those are the ones that find out what real living is all about. Amen. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. Amen. He's what it's all about. He's what it's all about. Listen, we come to that river of Jordan. Amen. That, that's, that's what he's talking about. This is a point of change. There's something about that old life that I put off and that new life that I'm putting on and I'm ready to cross that river of Jordan. And as I'm working for him and I'm walking with him, thank God he's going to show up and help me. Because that's what he did for him. Elisha found out where is the Lord God of Elijah. So he smote those waters. The Lord worked for him. And those doors opened up just like Walmart. Walking in those electric doors. He walked over on dry land. And there was a testimony that God had empowered him. Boy, I thank God this morning. We don't have to spend our life on the wrong side of Jordan. Amen. We make a choice today to follow Jesus Christ. And to get involved in the work of God. Soon following Elisha's successful crossing of Jordan, convinced the, the prophets there, they thought Elijah had been taken up and cast on some mountain out there or put down in some valley somewhere. They said, we got to go looking for him. He said, no, you don't. He's not going to be found there. They said, yeah, let us go. Finally, he was ashamed. He said, go ahead, look for him. And he found the place where they were going to dwell, and they was out looking for him. They came back and said, well, we can't find him. He said, I told you we ain't going to find him. He's with the Lord now. And they looked at the place where Elisha had picked. And, and this is over there in chapter 2. If you just want to look back there real quick towards the end of the chapter. And they, as they look at the place, they, they, they realize this is a fine and a pleasant land. But they discovered that the land was barren and the waters of that place were not. In other words, they come to him and they say, look, we, we don't want to complain. But here's my complaint. <laughs> And that's the situation. And, and uh, all the good things of Jericho, where he's dwelling, somewhere outside of Jericho, it lacked the one essential thing to sustain life. And that was good, drinkable, usable water. Water that would clean them and nourish them. Water for life. It didn't have it. For whatever else the place had, it didn't have water. And this is talking again about us being involved in the work of God. 
us being used of the Lord, our role in the ministry, each one of us have a role. And here is Elisha. What did he do? Well, look at verse 19, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise. This is Elisha talking. And put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I've healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha which he spake. The Lord Jesus speaking to his disciples, and if you're a disciple this morning, this applies to you. He said, You're the salt of the earth. He also goes on to say salt is good. You're also one that is yielded to His service. You're a vessel for the Master's use, just like that new cruise. That Elisha took that salt and he put it in there and he poured that salt into those spring of waters. You know what he took care of? He took care of the problem of death. He took care of the problem of barrenness there. Listen, friends, I mean, a lot of situations that we may find ourselves in this morning are less than ideal. Right? I mean, we may look at it and say, well, this is a good deal. I'm thankful for this. But <laughs> I don't want to be one to complain, but here's my complaint. <laughs> Amen. Someone says, I I'm glad to have a job in Scott County's economy. If you've got a job in Scott County's economy, you better be glad you got one. You better be thankful for it. But then you walk away and you say, well, you ought to see the way those people act. You ought to hear the way they talk. And there's no way for a Christian to be in. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't appreciate this job. And then on the other hand, uh, I am thankful I've got one. And then some folks say, well, I just, I'm not going to work it. I, I just ain't going to be around people like that. You know what your job might need? <laughs> it might need some salt curing waters. Amen. Coming from a new vessel, amen, a worthy vessel, a new cruise. The New Testament says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. You say, this is no place for me. It may be just the place for you. You may show up with a testimony for Jesus Christ and make all the difference in your workplace environment just by being a good employee. Being on time and not laying out and working hard and doing right and not partaking in all the ungodliness but keeping your joy. Amen. That's our strength. That's our testimony. Maintain the joy of the Lord and have the peace of God in your heart. No one can argue with that. And they can't argue with your salvation testimony. No one can argue with what the Lord's done for you. You'll make a difference in people's life like that way. Again, showing us something about walking with the Master and working for the Master and how that represents balance for the Christian there. No sooner is he involved in the Lord's work, he walks and he journeys from there at Jericho to Bethel. And he begins to meet with this young opposition, the taunts of children. Times there are just like Elijah, very dark, people's attitude toward the work of God, towards the servants of the Lord, were, were not ideal. And Elisha's feeling that through the taunts of children. And someone says, well, they were just children, but children pick up things they've learned at home. And these children had learned to mock the man of God, to laugh at him and to make light of him. They're saying, go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And I don't know, you know, what particularly they were speaking of in Elisha's case. I do know this, that Old English... There can be referring to either someone with no hair or someone with white hair. I hope you understand that. Amen. That like the bald eagle. Amen. He's not called bald because he don't have any feathers on top. It's because he's white-headed. And some of us were going bald. Amen. Losing our hair. And some of us going bald because it's turning gray. But, but that's proper. You look up the references in your Bible. No one's changing the Bible. Some of y'all are looking at me like, he's changing the Bible. I'm not changing the Bible. You look it up, you'll see biblically what I'm saying is true. You'll also see, amen, that this is true according to Webster's Dictionary. But I think we're learning something here, amen. The, the fact is, whether these young people are showing they have no respect for the elderly or they have no respect uh, for those that are elders in the work of God there, regardless of what their problem with respect is, it's not going to end well. You understand? Amen. Well, they didn't respect Elisha. They didn't respect the work that he was doing. I'll tell you who did. God did. Amen. And once the curse of the Lord was breathed out of his mouth, there two she bears came out and destroyed those children. What a terrible fate. What a terrible thing. I say that to say this this morning. Parents, 
Grandparents, you better make sure you foster an appreciation in your children and grandchildren for the work of the Lord Amen. and for those who do it. Because if they don't have that, it's not going to end well for them. It certainly won't. Not all of them will meet with that dramatic end that those young people ended up with. A lot of people have been destroyed for a lot less and in a lot different ways. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Everyone here has a preference. We have preferences of our preachers and we have preferences of their style of preaching and there's no way to get around that. But we don't need to make convictions out of our preferences. If that man preaches the book and he preaches the truth and he points people in the direction of Jesus Christ, amen, you better teach your children to respect that man amen. and respect the work that he's doing. It's only in their best interest that that happens. Otherwise, what happens is we start to develop this click mentality of personalities. And if it's not Cephas or Apollos or Paul, we have a problem with it. You understand what I'm saying? Soon we're dividing up the body of Christ because of the personality preferences that we have. And after a while there, it's not just a personality thing. It's a conviction thing. I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas. Pretty soon it's my team against your team and my group against your group and over nothing. Man. over styles, over methods, over manners. And the thing gets divided up. You know what happens in the lives of children? They're watching all that and they begin to despise, make light of the whole thing. And it won't end well for them. Elisha gives us again an illustration of what it means to be balanced. Walking with the Master and working for the Master. Over in 2 Kings chapter 3, we begin to see that he's a prophet of grace. Once again, in that setting there, uh, you've got Jehoshaphat, who's a good king, hasn't learned his lesson from the last time he was in this very situation with King Ahab. Now he's hanging out with King Ahab's son, Joram, who's replaced Ahaziah, his brother, to the throne. And he's reigning there, and they've got together with the king of Edom to go and make war against the Moabites. And on the march there, they recon a group out there for seven days looking for water. They're out in the middle of nowhere, and for seven days they can't find any water. The king of Israel hits the panic button. He says, the Lord has gathered our armies and these three kings together to deliver us into the hand of the Moabites. We've had it. It's over. We're dead. And Jehoshaphat calms the situation down, once again asks the question, is there not a prophet of the Lord here? And one of the servants of the king of Israel said, well, yeah, there's this one guy. But he used to hang out with Elijah. <laughs> and before he can finish what he's saying, Jehoshaphat said, get him. We need him. That man has the Word of God. And they bring Elisha in. And Elisha's attitude when he shows up there with the, with the king of Edom and the king of Israel there is, uh, he says to the king of Israel, why don't you go and check out with the preachers that your mama listened to, king? Why don't you hang out and find the answer for the religion your daddy endorsed? He goes on to say, if it weren't for that man right there, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, the son of David, I wouldn't even shown up. And then as he's saying this, the king of Israel hits the panic button again and says, see, the Lord's delivered us into the hand of the Moabites. We've had it. We've... And, and he says, basically, shut up. He says, let me tell you what's going to happen. He brings in a minstrel that begins to play and his heart calms and, and in that setting there, Elisha begins to tell him what's going to happen, what has to happen. They need to dig ditches out in that valley there. They haven't been able to find water and he says in those ditches, even though it hadn't rained, God's going to provide you water if you'll fill that valley with ditches. And he says, and this isn't even a hard thing for the Lord to do. I'll tell you what else he'll do. If you'll dig those ditches out in that valley and fill that valley with those ditches I'm talking about, he'll fill them with water. It'll be enough for you. It'll be enough for your livestock. You'll be okay. And then God will deliver you from the Moabites by those ditches you've dug. And sure enough, they dig those ditches. They fill up with water. They're drinking from them. They're all okay. They abandon that valley. And the Moabites come right down there and they look down there. And something about the way they're looking at that, the Lord causes them to see they think it's blood filling up those ditches. And, and, and the king of Moab says, well, those three armies and those three kings have turned on each other. And so help me, he says, they have slew everybody. And the field is covered with blood and there's nothing left for us to do except to go down there and get the spoil. And sure enough, they ride right down in there unprepared for battle and they ride right into a trap. And what they experience there, those that are with Elisha, is a victory through grace. In a war they couldn't win, amen, because they, they couldn't even find water. And, and no sooner had Elisha returned from that international conflict, you could say, 
He enters into people concerns. And it's a grieving widow and a great woman there in chapter 4. First, the widow woman has a godly husband, and he's died and gone on, and her and her two children don't have provisions for themselves, and the collector of their debt has showed up at the door. And in those days there, if you couldn't pay your debt, they took you off as a servant, or they took your children off as servants, and she's about to lose her two boys after she's just lost her husband because they can't pay their debt. So she runs to Elisha and says, What am I going to do? And Elisha says, Well, now wait a second. He says, You got anything in your house? And she says, I don't have anything. And she goes, wait a second, I got this pot of oil. And he says, get that pot of oil. Gather all your containers. Get all your vessels. And he says, go out and borrow from all your neighbors all their vessels. And he adds to it, not a few. <laughs> get all you can. And she listens and he says, pour that oil. And she goes to pouring that oil. And I mean, she pours and every time there's a new vessel there, she's filling it up with that oil. And it just keeps pouring. As long as there's a vessel, she can pour it and fill it up with that oil that she's got. Till there's pots and pans and vessels and containers filled with oil all over the place. And she hollers to her son there, hand me another vessel. And he finally says to her, there is no more. We filled them all up. And the Bible says in that setting there, the oil stayed. The miracle was as long as it was a vessel, there was oil to pour into it. The oil stopped when the vessels were gone. Returning to Elisha, she says, now what? He says to her, go and sell that oil and pay your debt 